Welcome back, everybody, to We Are TPM with Kyle Teixeira and John Teixeira here again to talk to you. Um, this week, we are discussing how to do it wrong and still win. Um, so if at any point during this uh, our discussion, this podcast, you would you have any questions or would like some info on your portfolio or really any kind of consultation or information, um, shoot us an email at showmethemoney at wertpm.com. That's showmethemoney at wertpm.com. Or give us a call at 817-939-9039. Sometimes forget that one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I get so jealous every time you say that email address. Just I, I just I want to say it. Show me the money. I know, and you haven't sent RTPM. me an email. dot com. I haven't sent you an email <laughs> no, there. No, you haven't. Goodness gracious, I'm gonna have to change that right away. I don't know what's wrong. So today was kind of inspired by some recent events and um, recent conversations I've been having with um, an investor. Right. So part of what we're asking for people to send us their portfolios at show me the money at wertpm.com. That's exactly what I've got here. I've got somebody's portfolio. And come to find out that this person is looking to liquidate their portfolio. They're not a highly motivated seller, but they are looking to liquidate it, whether it's all at one time or um, little by little. So it's a rental portfolio, right? A rental portfolio, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Please forgive me for not being specific enough. So these are seven homes, right? All in the Arlington Mansfield area, um, Tarrant County, let's say. There's there's one or two in Fort Worth, I think. But um, that's what we're talking about, this, this unnamed person and their portfolio, okay? Because this is so typical of what I find when – I talk to investors about their portfolio and and they share the details with me. What I'm about to share with you is so typical and I'm hoping you and I Kyle we can kind of expand on this and have you know have an expanded discussion about some of the things we've talked about in the past, why people do things and and how we can do them better. Sounds like we're going to show them the money. Show right them the here money here in the discussion. I, I love it. Yes, we are. So the first thing is <clears throat> That really stands out from my conversations from this um, this particular investor is that they tried a larger local property manager that we you and I both know really well, and I'm not going to name them because I know them to not be uh, they don't do business the way I would do it if you know it's not my clients it's not just us. to clarify I don't like <laughs> I don't like the way they do business. I've been on both ends trying to deal with them, very difficult to deal with. And what I find from them and some of those bigger ones is they focus on vacancy rates, right? And what's the easiest way to focus on vacancy rate? Yeah, um, keep, a, keep bad tenants. Well, okay. <laughs> well, or or let's say you have something for rent, right? Mm. We focus- to anyone. We focus on our team on having great screening processes, right? Um, getting great tenants in so that we can win, right, for our clients. And we make them more money. That's kind of the mantra of our entire team. Mm-hmm. We all make decisions based on that. I see these property managers come in and they they lowball the market and they get – maybe they get 30 applications because – they uh, put it three, four hundred dollars lower than it should be, right? Because they're not looking out for their investor. What they're trying to do is get somebody in there as quick as possible and keep their vacancy rate low, right? Yeah, which is not the way to do it because, you know, it, it, if you're stretching down, there's just probably someone, one of those 30 applications, maybe the one you're picking is, is stretching up, yeah. right? So yeah. affordability is a big thing because it, it's not just protecting you, the tenant, the, the, the client, um, it makes it a real world situation that can actually uh, be a win for all parties. So the screening process is important. A lot of people downplay it, but it is, it is important for a lot of those reasons that yeah. we're going to get into here. Yeah, absolutely. Now, these aren't necessarily the reasons that this particular investor had a really bad experience with this property manager. And I did not get into the specifics of why. As soon as they told me which one it was, I didn't need specifics. I'm like, okay, I get it. Um, But the um, 
but how, getting the wrong property manager up front is kind of like getting the wrong attorney, the wrong insurance guy, the wrong real estate agent. Puts a bad taste in your mouth, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. And people don't, they don't look for the right one because, you know, there's there's two out of ten that that are doing a really bang up job for you. Yeah, and it's it's hard to. It's a harder of all the things you've said. It's harder to just do a trial run, right? You can fire an attorney, get a new one. You can fire a real estate and get a new one. You can fire a property manager, get a new one. But the logistics of it and the time horizon for those things is is a lot different. Um, generally, you have a one year commitment with most property managers. Yeah. Um, you know, that's not really a trial run. Um, and then transferring over management of a property and you know, all, all that stuff. It's, it? Yeah, it's not an easy process and it's not something that they're just like, okay, no, I'm doing it. It's, it, you know, that decision needs to be committed and um, followed and, through because it takes some time, especially for multiple properties. And put yourself in other people's shoes. How do you know if somebody told you they were going to do something for you and then, and then they didn't, how do you know the next guy is not going to just tell you the same thing? And then not fo- not follow through, right? Mm-hmm. You just don't really know. That's one of the nice things nowadays about being in this review based economy that we're in, is we rely a lot on those reviews, right? We rely on um, what our past clients and and peers are saying about us online. That it's kind of organic. Yeah, not just that. I mean, this is a common phrase these days, but the proof is in the pudding, right? Mm-hmm. So. Is a lot of this information like listings and lease rates and what the, you know someone you're considering what they actually le- lease things for uh, you can find that um, it can be found on online and see what these things lease for so um, if, if someone someone tells you they can do something and not justify it with any real world evidence then you know that's that's a red flag I should say so I'm not saying that the proof is always in the pudding but uh <laughs> That's a good point because you should be able to prove your performance in this business. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. So this person chose the wrong property manager and then chose to do it themselves afterwards because of it, right? That's really the bottom line. And that's that's a shame because this could have been, as we go through this, this could have been, this person won. Let's not forget, they're winning. By doing what they did, even the wrong way, they are still winning. So what we're talking about is how to make it way better, right? Mm-hmm. So that not only do you make more money and end up with a better quote unquote empire at the end, but you did it with a lot less effort. Isn't that the goal here? I mean, in any business, don't we want, it doesn't matter what business we start. Isn't the goal to make as much money as you can with the least amount of effort? Yeah. I mean, that's what throws it into the passive income category. It's Passive means you're not spending all the time doing the effort. You know, your that's money's right. working for you. So that's always the goal. That's right. All right. So huge problem number two with this investor. And this is probably the one we're going to focus on for the remainder um, of this podcast is um, rents being a total seven houses now, $4,000 low, lower than the market rate. Okay. So what you're saying to clarify is, com- mm-hmm. is collectively, they're collectively $4,000 under market. Yes. Okay. Yes. Some of them, you know, $500, some of them $300, you know, I, I have I actually have them all right here with me, but, but collectively, if you add it all up, they're literally $4,000 below rent. And while that's not, nor- that's not abnormal when I look at these portfolios, that's, that's quite a bit. But it's not abnormal for me to see low rents. Almost every time somebody sends me their portfolio, the rents are low compared to market value. Generally when it's self-managed, especially for a long period of time, yeah, that is what we see. Um, People don't have systems in place to do, right, to keep things at fair market value and they make those fear-based decisions we talk about. So here's what I heard from her. Can can I – I'm going to – this is almost verbatim what I heard from this particular investor – I promise not to raise the rent if they paid me on time every month and now they pay me right on time every month. Give me some thoughts about that, Kyle. Did you did you catch that? Yeah, yeah. So I promise not to raise the rents if they pay me on time every month and now they pay me right on time every month. 
We, There's a follow-up statement to this, too. Oh, I know. I know. Sounds like uh, what I said earlier, investing in your feelings. Because um, <laughs> that's the... Yeah, that's an interesting deal. Um, I'm sure they do pay on time every month because, you know, they know they're every all every month that goes on, they're the ones winning more and more and more. That's right. Because market rates go up. And as market rates go up, the investor's losing more and more and more for that deal. That's right. You know, I can't help but think, I don't know if this investor has a spouse, somebody that they're investing with, I know that they have kids. There's other people in their life, right? That are counting on them. This person isn't just neglecting or or they're not just neglecting their own wealth. They're literally cheating their entire family out of $4,000 a month because of this decision that they're making that they think is a good decision that, let me remind you, is still a winning decision. They're still going to win at the end. They're going to sell these houses. They had made a bunch of money while they were while they were doing it, and they're going to make a bunch of money when they sell their houses. They're still going to win. My contention is you could have won far greater than you did with a lot less effort. Well, and I'd go back and argue too that you know you said you used to talk about seven rentals. Is so? Can you give me years or a year or two? Where, like, were these people ever late? When they were late, did you raise their rent? Probably not, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, like, what's the deal? What's the deal in reality? Um, and I'm not saying making deals with people is, is the wrong way to go, but uh, making deals for yourself and investing in anything um, is what makes it an investment, not a detriment So, to your investment. Well, here's some ideas that come across when I think about this, when I think of, of this statement, okay? And the first one is, there's lots of ways this person is trying to affect a certain behavior. They're trying to make sure that their tenants pay rent on time. Well, there's lots of ways to affect that behavior. Mm -hmm. This is the one that they chose to do it, and it's costing them $4,000. What if the other, any of the other 19 or 20 ways that we, you and I could sit here and come up with to do that very same thing didn't cost you $4,000? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a deal to make, you know, in your head to make your life easier, right? Well, yeah. would four thousand dollars a month make your life a little easier? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Most people would say yes because most people probably, you know, not everybody even makes that per month at their normal job. So, what if I gave you four thousand a month? What if I walked up to this investor and said, "Hey, what would you do if I have four thousand dollars extra a month? I want to give it to you. What are you willing to do for me for that?" Well, I mean, if they, if if, if we. Uh, offer our services to them. That's what we're doing because we're not taking $4,000 a month, you know, right. um, they're going to be getting way more than they get now. But I mean, that's the first thought that comes to mind, but that's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's tailored towards my experience in the, in the general sense. It's, it's how, like, how long does this go on? You know, are you selling or trying to liquidate the pro portfolio now because of these deals? Because they're, they're, uh, there's no end to them. In seven years, what, how much will you be losing? Well, that's a good point because this is a little bit of a side note from, from our topic. But her low rents are affecting the offers that I'm able to get from my investors. Because investors make offers based on cap rate, which is based on, you know, partially based on the rental amount that they're getting. Mm -hmm. And when your rents are low, your cap rates are low, and it doesn't make your portfolio look good when it's time to liquidate. No. Well, that's because it doesn't stop appreciating the value of the properties, right? But your rents aren't appreciating in you know, fair comparison. You're setting yourself up for a problem that grows further and further as time goes on. That's exactly right. You are exactly right. So she doesn't care about these things because as far as she's concerned, she'll sell them individually, right? And so she's not an extremely motivated buyer. But... It still holds true. If you're hanging on to a portfolio and you think someday you might liquidate it all in, in one, you know, one group, keep in mind that those cap rates and those rents are going to affect the value of your portfolio. Now, they don't have to. You can do what this person's doing and wait till they're vacant and, and sell them like everyone else would. You absolutely can do that. But those you don't know what situation you're going to be in 
when you're ready to liquidate, when you're ready to to uh, move on and and sell those properties, right? So it's best to understand what you're doing when you're keeping keeping those rates low. How about this, Kyle? Um, how about maybe it's simply because people make decisions like this simply because they don't have the tools, the processes, and the know-how to do that collections properly. Yeah, collections, renewals, um, and market analysis, all three of those properly. Um, Because, yeah, that takes usually takes expertise. Um, You can... I'm sure you could get closer than being off by that amount per month uh, by just looking at, you know, general tools that are out there, um, like a estimate and stuff like that probably wouldn't get you off by $4,000 a month on seven properties. So um, it's not that it's not known. It, it's probably more of a problem that's intentional because something that comes to mind for me is mm-hmm. market rates, um, you know, it's not just about the investor. Uh, a lot of people try to you know, say it is, but, and I've seen this many times, if say you do this for three, four years, um, you're essentially doing a financial disservice to the tenant. Yeah. I mean, they're paying less money for years Mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Well, this deal will end eventually. And how does their life change when it does? Because four or $500 instead of one or two. Yeah. You sell them, they get slapped with a 50% increase because it hasn't been tapered up like and then Probably. their life could yep. adjust to it all that stuff uh so they're left with an option pretty you know generally these things come pretty quick okay they're it was sold to a new investor investor brings it up to market rate this is going to be your rate now you can't afford it you know now you got to go out there on the market oh now you're looking at the market and seeing this is market rate i can't afford anything comparable to what i've been living in for the last three years probably because i haven't you know, structured my financial situation according to that, you know, year over year over year. Um, and it really gets people. Um, it, I see, I've seen it many times, you know, people in three bedroom homes, uh, in these kind of situations that if they, you know, tapered their finances and everything like everyone else does, uh, accordingly is maybe this didn't happen, but now they're stuck. They had to go take a two bedroom, one bath apartment or something. Cause that's what they could afford. Um, not realizing that three months before that, when they bought their new car, that this would happen, you know, <laughs> tenants aren't looking at market rates until they need to. That's right. Um, some, you know, tenants in, even in this crazy market we've been in, they don't know. Most of them probably don't know that how much rental rates have gone up in the last year or two. Um, they, they sure find out when, uh, the time comes or when they go looking for something else, but that is what a market is, what people pay for uh, what's being offered. So, Well, Kyle, you, you segue perfectly into, you know, my, my final point on this and, and, and you pretty much made that point. And that is that if you are, you can't be scared of losing tenants because you raised the rate and got it to market value. Because if you, if you did an honest assessment of what market value is and what your competition, where your competition is, that's part of it, right? Meaning of a similar home in the area, what are they renting for, right? That's part of what you're assessing the market value to be. Then you shouldn't worry about losing a tenant because when you raise, when you give them notice of their new, of their new rental amount, or you offer them a renewal like we do at a discount, then you, you don't have to worry about them going to Zillow or realtor.com and finding a bunch of homes that they can live in cheaper and making it, it's not worth it for them to bear the expense of moving two blocks over if that house is exactly the same price and the same condition. Yeah. Yeah. But if, you know, they're never going to make that push in this kind of situation, but, uh, it also ties back to the appreciation I mentioned, you know, as your house appreciates, you go through hot markets like we've been in, um, and these units, uh, get appraised and on the tax level, uh, those taxes go up and they go up. If, you know, three, four years, we've seen what's happened the last three, four years, they go up over time, those tax rates go up. So your cost goes up. Well, your income's not going up. I'm sure at some point Mm -hmm. you're going to be losing money on this deal. Um, and that's why, you know, there's there's a lot of fundamental factors that make market rates go up, but uh, that is a piece of them. 
um, on the other side that, you know, tenants don't see, obviously, but it affects, like what you said, cap rate. It affects um, monthly costs and all that stuff. So it's it's important to protect your own investments, um, not in a uh, malicious way. You know, what we're describing is not malicious. It's it's marketable. Well, and, and again, I want to remind you, everybody that we're describing a condition that is still a winning condition, right? Like this person still did all the right things in the sense that they recognized the value in real estate building wealth for their family. They just didn't do it the way I think that they should have done it in order to win as big as they could have won really. And, and so I want to remind, I'll keep reminding people of that because you can do it wrong and still win. There's a million ways to do this business. There's a million ways to invest in real estate. There's a million ways to build wealth with real estate. And there's nothing wrong with all of them. Some of them are better than others. And our focus here is how do you get the most out of your residential investments mm -hmm. so that you can build wealth for your for your family and your business and, and your, your generations to come? That's really... Kyle, the reason why you and I sit here in front of these microphones and share with people is is uh, that is our focus. And that's why we're, I'm coming at this topic the way I am. Yeah, and I mean, we've said it, knowledge is power, and that's why we sit in front of these microphones, help share it and get people excited to build wealth for their family. So, And, and you can get excited and set this all up and then make one deal or one factor, one piece of it, um, make it not as big of a win as it should have been. So and it's not that you're always doing it wrong or doing it right. <laughs> you could be doing it wrong and still win is what you're describing. Exactly. It's, is it, are you doing it uh, optimally? Is, is there you go. The That's a great word. Are you doing it in the most optimal way? I love it. Hey, there's a follow-up. I promised you a follow-up um, response or a follow-up idea from this investor that kind of goes with this a little bit, right? And this is, this is a statement that I heard this investor say several times in my conversations with her. Well, and she says this matter of factly as if it's just true and everybody believes it. Well, the most important thing is to have a consistent tenant, right? Now, on the surface, that does not sound like a bad statement, does it? That doesn't sound wrong. There's nothing wrong with that statement on, on the surface. The problem with that statement is she's making decisions based on that, which is why she's $4,000 low. She's making decisions to make sure that that is the ultimate most important thing that happens. Well, what if she had $4,000 this month and $4,000 next month, $4,000 last month? What are we up to? $12,000? $4,000 Let's add up a few four thousand dollars every single month. Forty eight grand a year. You could, you could turn over a lot of houses a lot cheaper than four thousand dollars. I mean, like you know what I mean. Like we threw away a whole bunch of money so that we could save a little bit. That's what that com comes down to. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> portfolio might be twice as big. You know, go back to the building your empire we talked about. That's right. I mean, it it. It's only a snowball effect if you keep putting snow on it or, you know, the, the hill is not empty of snow or whatever you want to call it. But uh, it, it's all very important. I mean, there's multiple factors to every investment. This is a big part of them, the rate. And if you if you discount that for vacancy, then uh, consider that doing it wrong. No, what, 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 what does that... What does that instill? What thought does that instill in you, Kyle, when I say, well, the most important thing is to have consistent tenants? Like, is that really the most important thing? Is that the reason why you put your finances on the line, risked and invested a certain amount of money and time to start a business, a real estate business? Did you do all that so that you could have consistent tenants? I mean, having consistent tenants is good. I'm not saying you don't want them. I'm saying, is that really the most important thing? What if I have a bad tenant in there? Don't want them? Do I still want them? They'd be consistent. They will be consistent because honestly, with that bad. deal, you're trapping every tenant. You know, Event over time, you're it's a double-sided trap. I mean, they're not leaving. You you will get them there consistently because they're going to close their eyes to the market long enough to where they can't catch up. Mm -hmm. And so are you. So... 
you're getting consistency out of the deal, that's for sure. But is it the most important thing? No, I think, you know, like it's pretty general, but making being operating as optimally as possible is the most important thing. And that's considering all points <clears throat> of what needs to be done in a business. Like you said, it's a business. You sh- you can't just close your eyes to a piece of it and say, I'm doing great over here. This is the <laughs> only thing that matters. Um, <laughs> well, you know, you just talk about a business. Are you, can you f- say this is a business and past a certain cap rate, you can't pay the employees that run that business anymore. Oh, well, tenant consistency and lack of vacancy is the most important thing. Okay, mm. well, now you got no employees. <laughs> so so right. you've exceeded your payroll costs and now you can't <clears throat> do payroll. So you got to get rid right. of them. Instead of touching the market rates for an asset that is being uh, being rented lower than its value. So That's a good point. That's a good analogy. Be kind of, kind of like a business that doesn't do marketing. Like a business that does well, maybe, well enough, for the person who owns the business, like they're content with what it does, but it never does what it could have done because they chose not to do any marketing or, or have any growth. Mm-hmm. It's kind of kind of the same type of thing a little bit. Um, that's kind of falls in line with how to do it wrong and still win <laughs> a little bit, right? Well, I mean, like, let's, <laughs> let's think of a weird analogy. If you walked into a car dealership and you were going to lease a Volvo and then... They're like, actually, for the same price, you can lease this Ferrari. You know, as a consumer, you'd be like, well, that doesn't make any sense, but I'm going to take the Ferrari. We'll drive the Ferrari around for a year and come back around. And now you want a Ferrari and you come back to all ever dealerships and you can't afford a Ferrari. You can't even afford the Volvo anymore. Now you got to <laughs> give the Ferrari back. What are you going to drive? You know, you're going from that Ferrari back to, let's see, uh, a used Honda Civic or something, you know? So it. It's not, it's not a good deal for the consumer, um, and that's why I'm trying to frame it in that mindset. I was waiting to see where this <laughs> analogy was going. This analogy, I loved it. Um, all right, so the most important thing, and uh, uh, so having consistent tenants is important, though, Kyle. Right? So I'm not, I'm yes, not saying yes, it's not, no, I, but how do we get consistent tenants? I mean, this is a really simple answer. You well, said it at the beginning of this podcast. Well, and uh, consistent tenants are consistently paying, living there consistently, consistently, uh, you know, disclosing damages. They're just consistent, right? Um, where th- this this deal you described is not define them as consistent tenants because uh, I wouldn't say they're consistently paying on time. They're well. Let's assume they are. I'm told that they are. So let's assume that they're paying every month on time. Does that make them? But it's part of this. This this deal. So I mean, there's a caveat to it. Yeah, they're consistently paying on time, but they're consistently paying under market on time. You mm-hmm. know, so they're consistently paying seventy five percent on time. Um, is how how I look at it. But um, you said I said something at the beginning. What are you talking about? Screening. Oh yeah. I mean, you get consistency from your tenants through how they pay and how long they stay. By treating them fairly, by I'm sorry, first screening well, mm-hmm. right? Which also, if we back up one more step, that goes back to marketing really well so that you have a larger pool of people to choose from and then screening really well and making a great choice, right? And then um, treating your tenants fairly, right? Mm-hmm. That's that They're not necessarily technically our client, but they're in our client's homes, so we care about how they're how they are being treated because we want them to we want them to have a great life in our clients' homes and we want them to treat those homes with the respect that we'd that, that we'd all like them to treat it with, right? So so great marketing, great screening, treating your tenants fairly, that does not mean that does not mean, you know, don't raise the rent. That means treating them fairly, right? And you win. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's I, simple. Everyone talks about, you know, part of that was raising mm-hmm. rent. Um, I don't want it to sound like a blanket statement that you should just raise rent all the time. It's not. It's keeping it in line with market rents. Exactly. Just to clarify. That's it. <laughs> um, if the market doesn't go up, then you shouldn't be raising rents, right? Exactly but right. We just happen to live... In a couple of years of markets that have definitely gone up at a consistent rate. 
So I did uh, 33 renewals this past month for our for our clients, right? Mm-hmm. And they ranged from because some of them are takeovers. They range from not changing at all, right? Some of them were there was zero change for the for the next renewal to up to three or four hundred dollars because things are so you know we've taken some things over that were so far out of whack. You know what I mean? So that happens every single month. We do that and. Every single time we do those assessments for every single one of those 33 people, I walk away feeling like we did an extremely fair assessment and we usually offer them something, what we would consider to be a discount in order to get, you know, another one year commitment out of them. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's how we go about treating fairly, quote unquote, is what I'm saying. You're not necessarily just keeping everybody, you know, right at the top of market rate all the time. But hey, if you want to stay month to month, then that's where you're going to be. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, if it, and, and by that discount, it's it's that it's, you're not putting it on the market. You know, we use market rates, but you're already in the home and call it consistency uh, somewhere between where you're paying now. And if the market rate's gone up a ton, you know, you're not going to go all the way up to market rate if if you're matching that, then yeah, they are going to go look and say, Hey, I can go get this other property for the exact same price. Um, it's one of those <laughs> mitigation efforts for uh, consistency mm-hmm. in respect to the to tenants living in their own home. All right. So side note, if you send us your portfolio, we'll pick it apart on the podcast. No, we won't. But this one, <laughs> this one was kind of extreme. So I wanted to talk about it a little bit because it was, it's something that we see all the time, but, you know what? I'm going to help this person. We're going to liquidate this portfolio. We're going to find a buyer for it. And we're going to have great seven great new properties. And these tenants, they're so worried about these tenants. That's the other part we didn't get into too much. This investor is so emotionally invested into each one of these tenants. They can't even make a great decision if, if they tried because of how invested they are emotionally to these tenants, which is By the way, one of the biggest reasons why you should have a great property manager is to, to, we've talked about this before, to separate that owner-tenant relationship. Mm -hmm. It has to be separated. I don't care. I don't care how professional you are, how much know-how you have, how smart you are. It doesn't matter. Separating that relationship helps enormously. It does. does. Who manages your properties? You. Who manages mine? Me. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) We even do it, so you need to do it. And show me the money. This is the money. You only have seven, even if it's a seven seven property portfolio, the money we're showing is $4,000 a month. Um, There's some seven portfolio properties, or seven property portfolios that don't even profit $4,000 a month. what are you leaving on the table at wertbtpm.com is what I could change it to if you guys really want. But There you go. <laughs> and if you're listening to this, I mean, this might be sold by the time you hear this, but reach out to me. I may have another one or or this might still be available. Um, if you're looking for, looking to get into this and you think, hey, buying seven properties at one time to get started sounds like a great idea. You actually can get bulk loans for these things. So feel free to reach out to me. Send us an email at that email address or uh, that email I did address. A, yeah. I, that, we show me the money at wertpm.com. Here, I had an opportunity to we throw need it to out add there. aliases that is like that email address at wertpm.com. What are you leaving on the table at wertpm? No, I'm just kidding. Show me the money at oh. wertpm.com. You want that bulk loan info or those property info? Just you know, direct is better. 817 637 4658 will get you directly to John's phone and you can start talking about it. Love it. We closed out. We're going to close this out. Yeah, let's close out. Everybody have a good week. Is that it? <laughs> is that how we're closing Thanks this Thanks for thing joining out? us this week, guys, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Peace. We are TPM. Late.